Namihi Mayoha Kia Koto Katoa. A warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us today. As part of that welcome, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present and to the whakapapa and ancestors of those of us who choose to make our place on the lands cared for by the Tangata Whenua and our First Nations people. I'd also like to acknowledge that we've just started a minute uh, after 11 um, in recognition of Remembrance Day. And this will obviously uh, might be different uh, in different time zones. So feel free to take your own minute of silence um, when it's 11 a.m., wherever you happen to be. My name is Dave Sparks, and I am part of the Drupal South Committee, uh, bringing you the second leg of the Drupal South Shorts event today. Uh, I'd really like to thank everyone who has come along and shown their support. And uh, thanks for your interest in our online conference series this year. The response has been really amazing. Uh, it's great to see our industry doing well um, and continuing to do interesting and challenging work. Just a quick note, um, if you have any technical issues uh, as an attendee or a speaker or get stuck at any stage, live support is the orange icon near the top right of the platform screen. Um, we've got a good team standing by, ready to help you all have uh, an awesome experience today. As always, uh, Drupal to you by a team of volunteers and supported by our fantastic industry sponsors. Uh, they're all uh, online, available here, uh, ready to chat throughout the day. Um, so feel free to get in touch, uh, light up a discussion, follow up on, on their topics. Um, you can do this using the meeting hub on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, if you look at the schedule, there are some sponsor showcase sessions coming up later in the day where you can learn more. I'd like to, to just pause for a moment and give a, a huge and a, a heartfelt thank you to our sponsors. Um, thank you to Accenture, Acquia, uh, Amazie.io, Annex, Catalyst, Doghouse, Just After Midnight, Morphed, Pantheon, Previous Next, Salsa Digital, Sector and Skipper. We really appreciate your contribution um, towards the community and the conference today. Uh, not just not just for the conference today, uh, but supporting meetups and other industry programs uh, throughout the year. All profits from these Drupal South events go back to supporting those activities, um, including programs identifying and, and bringing new talent into the Drupal community. Um, so on behalf of the Drupal South committee and the community, a, a big thanks to those sponsors uh, for all that you do. Um, not just to make things possible, uh, but to support us to, to thrive and flourish. For the committee, um, you'll also see a spot in the schedule for the Drupal South Committee community update, um, where we can uh, give you uh, the latest on what's happening and what's coming up next year. If you'd like to learn more or do more, um, please do come along and we have an open door for participation uh, here at Drupal South. Now to kick the event off proper, um, I'd like to introduce Akhil Bandari, Engagement Man Manager at Salsa Digital. I'm sure uh, Salsa really need no introduction, um, but they've really stepped up and been a fantastic supporter for our online series this year. And uh, they are the keynote sponsor for today. So I'll hand over to you, Akhil. Excellent, thank you, Dave. Um, as Dave mentioned, my name is Akhil Bandari. I'm an Engagement Manager at Salsa Digital. And we're very pleased to be sponsoring today's keynote about Drupal 10 and beyond. Salsa Digital is a GovTech company that really is focused on helping governments become more open, more connected, and more consolidated. Salsa has been working past uh, Drupal with the past decade, and looking back, it's so much has improved. Especially in the past five years, we have seen a real growth of the Australian government as it's adopted Drupal as its platform of choice to better serve digital uh, citizens. My personal experience with Drupal has been working in government on Drupal sites on the business side for six or so years, and more recently on the vendor side with Salsa. From Drupal 7 to 8 to 9, we have seen how quickly a digital product with a vibrant digital open source community can grow. And it's been amazing to see the growth of the Drupal community, especially around government, as well as the aim to do more and do better with Drupal. Now, with Drupal 10 arriving soon, it makes today's event even more exciting especially to see where the community is going to lead Drupal today and beyond. Now, 
If you're not familiar with our speaker today from Drupal.org's issue queues, who goes by the handle LA Rowland, Lee Rollins has been our region's most prolific Drupal contributor over the past decade. He's joined Drupal's global security team in 2012 and has consistently been listed as a top 10 global code contributor ever since, rising to the esteemed ranks of Drupal core committer in 2018. As many of you would be aware, while Drupal is a free open source software, the time and effort behind the scenes from people like Lee is absolutely critical to all of our projects, businesses, and careers. Lee will touch on how you can start your own journey as a Drupal contributor in today's talk. And I'd strongly encourage you to join tomorrow's online code sprint, details of which are on the Drupal South website. Since Drupal 8 was released six years ago, we've seen Drupal mature into a product that's mission critical for organizations building complex, large-scale digital platforms. With Drupal 10 just around the corner, Lee will delve into what we need to be ready for and what direction the project is heading in beyond that. Thanks, Lee, and over to you. Uh, can I get my slides up, please? Thank you very much. Okay, welcome everyone. So make yourself comfortable. There's a great program of sessions coming up today. And just looking through the list of attendees, I can recognize a lot of the names there. And I actually think that's a problem, but we're going to get into that later. So as Akil said, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm not going to go into much of the detail here, only to say that if you want to talk to me about anything that I talk about here today, uh, both today or in the future, feel free to reach out to me. My username is LA Roland. The best place to get in contact with me after the event is probably on Slack. So if you head to drupal.org slash Slack, there's instructions there how to sign up. And if you join the Australia NZ channel, uh, you might be the lucky 500th member. We're getting very close. So an overview of today's session, uh, we're going to talk about in two parts. The first part is going to be largely informative, to give you an update on what's coming. And the second half is going to be a bit more navel gazing. There'll be some questions and I hope you come away with some things to mull over. So we'll talk about where are we, where are we going, and where do we need to go? So where are we? Well, as Akil said, Drupal 10 will come out next year. A quick recap of the release cycle. 10.0 and 9.4 will come out next year. We hope to hit June 15, 2022 for 10.0. But if we miss that date, we've got a couple of fallback dates. The next one is August 16th, and the following one is December 14th. Depending on whether or not we hit that June deadline, there may be a 9.5 in the middle there. But at this stage, our plan is to release 9.4 and 10.0 next year. 9.3 will come out next month. In fact, it's the beta release week this week, and we encourage you to help test those uh, pre-releases. There's a real bevy of new features coming, and any feedback we can get now, we'll make that as smooth as possible when we get to the uh, 0.0 release. Drupal 8 itself is end of life. As Akil said, it's six years old, it came out in January 2015 and was end of life in November 2021. To give you an indication of what things were like when Drupal 8 was released, the latest iPhone model was iPhone 6. So it's quite some time ago. And if your site still relies on Drupal 8, then your homework when you get back to work next week is to get yourself to Drupal 9. There will be no more security releases for Drupal 8. Drupal 7 has got another year to go to its end of life. It'll be end of life in November 2022 but it's been out since January 2011, making it 11 years in total. There will be a paid extended support option available from vendors. And if you're interested in that and you haven't been able to move off Drupal 7 yet, I encourage you to search for Drupal 8, 7 extended support plans. If you are in Drupal 8 and you do have some homework to do, updating between major versions now is much easier. This link will take you to the handbook page on drupal.org that gives you a rundown of a lot of the automated tooling you can use to make that process easier. And this is all provided and you're on Drupal 8. So the question many people may be asking is two years too soon for Drupal 9. If Drupal 9 came out in June 2020 and Drupal 10 is coming out in June 2022, is that too soon? And the answer is no, because we need to give people time to upgrade. So what's driving this? Well, it's basically end of, life dates, end of life dates for our dependencies. 
And it's compounded by the fact that we're one major release behind Symphony. So the major release of Symphony at the moment is Symphony 4, 5 and PHP uh, Drupal 9 is still on Symphony 4. So let's have a look at our security support for our dependencies. Drupal 8 was end of life in November 2021, and it relied on Symphony 3. Symphony 3's end of life was November 2021, hence the Drupal 8 end of life. And actually, Symphony extended the end of life of Symphony 3 just for us, so we could get the life that we did out of Drupal 8. For Drupal 9, CK Editor 4 is what's driving the end of life. CK Editor 4 is end of life in November 2022. So you want to give people six months to update, hence why the June release date in Drupal 10. Now, Drupal 10, we hope to get to Symphony 6 on. At the moment, a lot of work is taking place in the community to get to Symphony 5.4, remove the deprecations, and upgrade to Symphony 6. We also are debating whether we will make 8.0 or 8.1, the minimum PHP version, Drupal 10, but it will be 8, PHP 8 of some form, so there will be no support for PHP 7. And not surprisingly, we're going to need CK Editor 5. Now, the difference between CK Editor uh, between Symphony 5 and Symphony 6 is quite significant. It's another two years of effective life for Drupal 10. So we're doing our best to get for Symphony 6. It will mean that we'll be jumping two major versions, but we think that it's worth it. So that's where we are. The next question is, where are we going? Let's have a little bit of a look at how the minor updates work. If you running a site on Drupal 9.1, and you updated to that in December 2020, which was when it was released. Its end of life is December 2021, i.e. next month when Drupal 9.3 comes out. So this means you must update at least once a year to remain on a security supported version. What we're proposing is to have regular two year majors. Now at the moment, Drupal 8 had a four year life and Drupal 9 had a two year life. What we're proposing is to make that consistently two years. So Drupal 11 will come out in June 2024, two years after Drupal 10, and Drupal 12 will come out in June 2026, two years after Drupal 11. We're also proposing to have an LTS release three months before the next major, LTS standing for long-term service. So in that case, 11.4 will come out in March 2026, three months before 12, and 10.4 will come out in March 2024, three months before 11. But here's the real sweetener of this proposal. We're proposing a six month overlap between the LTS releases. So that means the end of life for 10.4 will be September 2026, six months before, six months after 11.4 comes out, and the end of life for 11.4 will be September 28, six months after 12.4 comes out. So under this proposal, Drupal 10.4 will come out in March 2024 and be security supported until September 2026, which means you must update once every two and a half years. Now, this is all assuming that this plan gets consensus and the issue ID for this is 3238652. But what we expect with this is that people will just jump from LTS to LTS. So they'll go directly from 10.4 to 11.4 and won't go to 11.32 and 1 and 0 in between. This is not dissimilar to what a lot of people do with Ubuntu releases and also with Symphony releases. They jump from Symphony 4.4 to 5.4 and so on. So there's just some disclaimers here. This hinges on releasing Drupal 10 on Symphony 6 and to a lesser extent PHP 8.1. By the time that end of life of 10.4 comes around, PHP 8 will be end of life itself. It also assumes that some of our other dependencies play nice. So as you saw before, we also rely on other third-party libraries such as CK Editor, but there's also things like Guzzle and Doctrine. And if that's not the case, then we might need to do some things creatively to continue to support those after their end of life. For example, we do some creative things behind the scenes to support multiple versions of PHP unit, and we may need to do similar to support multiple versions of our other dependencies that don't have such uh, fixed deadlines or such fixed end dates like Symfony does. So with that distant future aside, what's coming in Drupal 10? But actually, this is wrong, and we need to stop thinking this way. We instead need to think about what's coming in 9.3, which is out this month. Oh, sorry, which is out next month. Because we build Drupal 10 in Drupal 9, 
and we'll build Drupal 11 in Drupal 10. So what is coming in Drupal 9.3? Well, the big feature is PHP 8.1 support. PHP 8.1 will be released this month, encompasses with new language features. And a lot of work has gone on behind the scenes, hundreds of issues to remove deprecations emitted from core for using language features that, that are, uh, would be removed. So this means if you want to, want to use one of those new PHP 8.1 language features, you'll be able to run 9.3 on PHP 8.1 with core, without core emitting any deprecation errors. You might not get the same mileage from Contrib, but the community will lift those up pretty rapidly like they have with PHP 8. Uh, another feature coming is bundle classes. And this was described by Mosh, the maintainer and author of Drush, as one of the biggest features to come to Drupal in a long time. This lets you write a class to use to encapsulate your business logic and tell Drupal to use that class whenever you're dealing with a bundle of that type. So for example, you could write a class called recipe and declare the recipe class to be used for the recipe content type. And then any logic that you have that relates to recipes can go in that class. This means you can use the methods on that class in twig files and skip the need for pre-processing, but it means you write a lot cleaner code and you'll be able to add a lot more test coverage for your functionality. Another new feature is the Manage Permissions tab. This will sit alongside Manage Fields and Manage Display, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail shortly. Another developer-facing feature is generic revision access. So previously, if you wanted to check if a user had access to view or revert or delete a revision, you had to do some special juggling based on the entity type. So if it was a node, you'd have to say, okay, does the user have these permissions? If it was media, you had to check a different set of permissions. And that was just the ones that you knew about. With this new API, you can simply call access on the entity and pass in new operations to deal with viewing revisions, deleting revisions, and reverting revisions, and you'll get back an access result. One thing we hope to ship is CK Editor 5. This will ship as an experimental module. And because it's an experimental module, it doesn't have to be in Drupal 9.3 before the alpha and beta deadlines. So the beta deadline is this week. And we'll, if we get this to uh, alpha levels, to, uh, beta level stability, we'll still put this in after those deadlines. Being an experimental module, it's more for people to test it rather than to be used in production. We're also very close to marking our two new themes stable. So Olivero, the front end theme, and Clearo, the back end theme, are very close. And one of the final blockers for Olivero went in overnight. So hopefully we're very close to that point. Now, a couple of asterisks here. These are all things going to plan. So this is the Manage Permissions tab. As you can see here, I'm looking at the recipe content type. We've got the Manage Fields, the Manage Form Display tabs, and we're showing just permissions that relate to the recipe. You'll also notice that these are just permissions from the Node module. There's some permissions from Layout Builder and from Content Translation. And this is made possible by some new improvements in Drupal 9.3 to do with the config dependencies between roles and the permissions and the things that define those permissions. So previously, if you enabled a content type and then you went and gave some permissions to a role for that content type and then exported your configuration, but then deleted the content type, those permissions would hang about in your role forever. Now with this new configuration dependency between permissions and the things they depend on, the role is able to update itself to remove those permissions when the content type has been deleted. And that also means we can do really cool things like this. By interrogating that information, we can ascertain which permissions depend on the recipe content type and show a smaller cut down permission form just for that content type. Here's a screenshot of CK Editor 5. And this is using the Linkit country project the Linkit Contrib project is a very popular addition to CK Editor that gives you the ability to search for links to existing Drupal content. And the great news is this has already been ported to CK Editor 5 as a proof of concept that the APIs that have been written on the Drupal side can support some of the most popular Contrib projects. It's also using Drupal's new autocomplete component, which is a new component that we've written that lets us uh, get rid of jQuery UI, but I'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. So beyond 9.3, what's coming in 9.4? Well, if we miss marking Olivero and Clero stable in 9.3, we'll definitely get them in 9.4. We also plan to deprecate 
the forum, HAL, aggregator, and quickhead modules and move them to Codtrib in Drupal 10. So they'll still be in Drupal 9.4, but they'll be deprecated. And that will provide you a link from the admin page, hopefully telling you what to do to upgrade. We also plan to bring in a new experimental, experimental module called Decoupled Menus module. And this adds JSON API support for menu links, not just for menu links defining content, but also, also menu links that come from out of modules, etc. Because of the new revision uh, accessing coming in 9.3, this unlocks expanded JSON API support for revisions. So at the moment, JSON API can only fetch revisions of media and node entities. With those changes in 9.3, this unlocks the ability for us to be able to expand that to any revisionable entity. And it also unlocks us the ability to add UIs for those. If we have a look at the generic um, revisions UI feature, this gives us the ability to add uh, the same sort of UI that you see for Node. So the ability to compare revisions, revert revisions, and view previous revisions. Previously, this was only possible for Node unless you added some contrib projects and those contrib projects were all doing things differently. This gives us a nice consolidated API to make it much easier to add that. And as I mentioned, there's a new autocomplete and dialogue component that's being worked on. And this is to help us move away from jQuery UI, which is now end of life. So some of these have got stars on them. That's all things going to plan. I've got a screenshot here of the new Olivero front end theme. We hope to put this as the default front end theme in the standard profile, which is still currently Bartik. Bartik was created in 2010, 2011. So it's very old and it's getting very long in the tooth. And this new theme, Olivero, is a great foot forward to Drupal for people evaluating. So with all those things coming in 9.3, and 9.4, we expect 10.0 to be boring. And this is by design. We, we, for those of you on, on Drupal 7, this is probably cold comfort, but we've learned from the upgrade process. And so 10, just like 9.0, will be the previous LTS minus deprecations. And it'll be easier again to upgrade. The release cycle between eight and nine was a four year period. And between nine and 10 will only be two. So there's much less deprecations to remove. In fact, here's a chart from Gabor's presentation at DrupalCon Europe showing the type of deprecations and how we can remove them. And as you can see, well over half of them can be fixed by automated tooling. So what about in 10.x? This is where the new features start because in this way of thinking, we build Drupal 11 in Drupal 10. One important initiative is the automatic updates. At the moment, they're making some great progress. They've already got the ability for you to see public service announcements in your admin UI. They've built a whole API to perform readiness checks to ascertain whether your site's ready to upgrade or not. And contrib projects will be able to hook into this. They've built the ability for Drupal.org to sign an update and for your site to verify that update to prevent man in the middle attacks. They've got the ability to apply updates with rollback. And the final piece of the puzzle is a composer-based updater. So all of the features they've delivered are available in the Contrib project in the 1.x branch and work is underway for the Composer updater in the 2.x branch. Here's a screenshot of their designs. And a lot of people in this call will probably be thinking that this isn't for them. If you're on GovCMS or you're on Acquia or Lagoon or one of our clients, for example, you don't apply security updates directly to production. You normally apply them either locally or in a development environment and you go through a dev stage pod pipeline. But the automated updates is still very important to the project. And we're gonna explain that in a little bit more detail later. Another important initiative is the project browser initiative. Work here is also happening in Contrib and there's a team that meet weekly in the project browser channel. This will build on top of the automatic updates to work with Composer under the hood, but it'll provide you with a UI in your site to be able to browse modules and themes from Drupal.org, filter them, sort them, look at the number of installs and the number of stars. And again, a lot of people in this call will probably think this isn't for them. You don't install sites on production. You know, you use Composer and other things on, and you do go through a dev stage pod pipeline, but it's still very important to the health of the project. And as I mentioned before, we'll talk about that in more detail later. Another initiative, easy out of the box, is focusing on getting the layout builder, media, and Clero enabled by default in the standard profile. 
Now, I've made my opinions on the stamp profile well known. Now, if you're interested in hearing more about that, there's a session I gave at Drupal South Gold Coast called At 16 Years of Age, Does Drupal Have an Identity Problem? where I talk at length about the issues I see in the standard profile. But since then, the Yamami profile has shown us what is possible with install profiles in core. And a lot of people in this call, again, will probably be thinking, I know how to enable Layout Builder. I know how to configure media. I know how to turn on Claro. But this is more game aimed at people that are new to the project. We want them starting their sites on the good foot. At the moment, the article content type ships with an image field, which is something we haven't done for years. Everything's been focused on media entities for quite a long time. Another important project is the starter kit theme. Here's a Drupal NID for the meta around that. If you've been working with Drupal long enough, you probably remember the Zen theme, which was very popular in six and seven days and had commands for generating a new sub theme. And it's basically the same concept, but in core. What this will let us do is deprecate and remove the class and stable themes. Now at the moment, most of you are probably basing your themes off that and thinking this is a bad thing. But there's actually a problem with the class and stable theme. And the problem is if we find a bug in the markup, and we have found several, we can't actually fix it in core. Because we've got a markup guarantee, if we change that markup, it might break your site. So we have to just tolerate those bugs. And we try to fix them between major versions. And if you move from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9, you'll probably notice that a new theme appeared, Classy 9, which was Classy 8 with the bugs fixed. And that way it's a it's basically a, uh, you have to make that decision to move from class eight to nine and fix any bugs that it might uh, come out of that upgrade so having a starter kit theme will let us fix bugs in core because every site that's using a theme based on that will be based on that point in time and we can fix bugs in the starting point so that any new sites that come online don't continue to have those bugs old sites will have to take those changes manually but at least we won't be breaking other things we're still continuing the death march to remove jQuery. And we've actually turned on no jQuery ESLint rules now. This issue is a meta tracking all of the uh, all of the detailed ESLint rules. And there's lots of short, small issues underneath this that are easy to get involved with. They're great for tomorrow's code sprint. So that's where we are and where we're going. Now to the more navel gazing part of the talk, where do we need to go? We've got quite a few questions here. And I don't have the answers to all of them, but I hope some of these questions spawn some good questions and answers. And if you'd like to talk about these with me further, uh, feel free to get in touch, as Dave mentioned, by the chat functionality of the conference or after that via Slack. So my first question is, if dependencies are driving our end of life, was getting off the island the right thing to do? Was bringing in all those external dependencies at the expense of end of life worth it? And does the fact that Drupal 7 is still kicking indicate we got it wrong? Now, to an outsider, this may seem to be the case. But the reality is core development is done by a small pool and they're stretched thin as it is maintaining the code that we wrote ourselves, let alone adding in other code that we don't even have to think about at the moment. And this leads me into a bit of a discussion around how core development works. A lot of people think we have predefined targets or predefined priorities and we work towards those in a you know, organized fashion like you would with the sprint and we ship our releases but how it actually works is that organizations and individuals bring their ideas and they progress them to fruition now Acrea is the exception here they fund a lot of initiatives that probably don't help their business but do help the ecosystem and we're grateful for that but say for example lullabot here that Olivero theme, they identified the need for a new theme in Drupal 9, and they brought that to fruition. Some local examples, Service New South Wales, the New South Wales Department of Customer Service and my employer, Previous Next, have driven a lot of the big changes in 9.3, like the generic provision support, and to a lesser extent, the bundle classes. And I realize that not everyone knows enough about the guts of Drupal and how Core works to contribute patches. But there are other ways to contribute and you can always sponsor someone if you have an idea that you'd like to bring to fruition. Someone who's recently become a regular contributor to Drupal Core is Max Bognowski. Max is based in Sydney and came along to our sprint in August in Drupal South and since then he's become a major contributor. And since doing so, one of the things he found is this. I'm rapidly discovering that what I thought was a large group of people working together to guide Drupal Core is a lot smaller than I once thought. 
because the reality is contribution comes from a small pool. And core nowadays is very vast. There are sub sub systems in core that I can count on one hand the number of people who have a deep knowledge of how it works. In fact, there are some parts of core where the loss of a single individual could cause progress to grind to a halt. Which brings me to another quote. I've said this before, but I think it bears repeating. For an ecosystem that provides gainful employment to so many, so much work falls to so few. This is perhaps most evident if you look at maintainers.txt. This is a text file that ships in Drupal's code base that lists the individuals responsible for each of the specific subsystems. There's some quite large holes in there at the moment. There are some subsystems with no, no maintainer listed at all. People pitch in here and there to help with bugs in that component. But if your business relies on this piece of core, maybe you could step up and help out. Or perhaps you could sponsor someone to do it. All of this is taking place against a, a uh, environment where contributions are down. If you've read Dries's blog post or you saw his presentation from DrupalCon Europe, you will have known that there's been a 10% decline in individual contributors over the last 12 months and a 2% decline in organizational contributors. Now, COVID is a factor here, but there's also a smaller pool of people. All the while, businesses are booming. In the Drupal Business Survey 2021, well, over two thirds of respondents indicated they felt the business was going to grow and quite a lot of them thought it was going to grow significantly. Now, if you look at the Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 statistics for usage stats, you'll see that there's still quite a lot more Drupal 7 sites. But business is still booming because we're building bigger sites, more complex sites, but just less of them. And this is perhaps most evident if you look at the usage stats for the Drupal 7 Contrib Project jQuery update. It still has more installations than Drupal 8 and 9 combined. So to try and address some of this imbalance, the Drupal Association have introduced the Certified Drupal Partners Program, trying to bring a focus on makers versus takers. Their intention here is to recognize organizations that contribute back and award them with certified Drupal partner status. There are tiers of status, are there are tiers of recognition, and those that have been recognized will get stronger exposure throughout Drupal.org versus those who haven't, who will get none. Now, contributing to Drupal is often something that is attractive to developers. Whilst all this is happening, it's getting harder and harder to fill jobs. If anyone's hiring that week, lately, they would know it's hard. And locally here in our Australian New Zealand community, it doesn't seem like the pool is growing. As I said at the start, I recognize a lot of the fact that the names in the contributor list, in the attendee list here. And I think that's a problem because we're not seeing new faces. At the moment, Organizations like Oxide, Previous Next, Salsa, the New South Wales Department of Customer Service are all hiring. If you are looking, please check out the Australian New Zealand Jobs Channel. One of the things that's making hiring harder are the barriers to entry. There's a blog post today from Drupalize Me about the things that you need to become a Drupal developer. If you read that list and you're an experienced developer, you probably tick them off and go, yes, yes, yes. But I encourage you to go back and look at that as an inexperienced developer and see how many things and how much prior knowledge is required just to be productive. If I think about how I got started, luckily I was building sites for local businesses. But as we get to more and more complex projects with bigger budgets, there's less opportunities for those smaller organizations to get into the community. Now, this is where initiatives like Project Browser and Automatic Updates and Easy Out of the Box help. They help make Drupal more attractive to new organizations and they bring in community members that can help grow the community. Project Browser, for example, at the last global training day I ran, I avoided talking about adding modules to the site because it's a minefield. Now, adding modules used to be a major selling point of Drupal. There's a module for that, but now it's too complex to cover in a single day's training. All the while this is happening while JavaScript is eating the web. There is a myriad of JavaScript-based CMSs and decoupled CMS as a service offerings are coming up fast behind us, like Contentful, Prismic and Sanity. Now I spoke about this topic at length at a couple of days this year and did a detailed review of those offerings. So I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. But entry to this space is much simpler. Hosting is easier and they have great starter kits. 10 years ago, a small agency could host Drupal 7 on a cPanel and it was easy to see why. Nowadays, it's more and more difficult. And as, as a result of that, some of these offerings seem more attractive than Drupal. So if JavaScript is where new developers are starting out, 
how do we as a community build a bridge to them? There's a couple of menus initiatives that step in the right direction. We've already worked out how to ship NPM packages from Drupal.org. We've worked out tooling for non-PHP projects. We've enabled GitLab features like group GitLab pages and CI. And we're already using this for some core JavaScript libraries, like the once library, which is replacing jQuery UI and the auto-completed dialogue that I spoke of before. We have a great headless offering in JSON API, but there are many places where the API is a second class citizen to theme and form APIs. Just ask Stuart from Reality Loop, who's doing great work with Druxt about this. So I'm gonna leave you with one final question. What can we as an Australian New Zealand community do to address some of these issues? What can we do locally to attract new talent to the project? Where are the entry level conferences? My first conference was a Drupal camp in Brisbane in 2010, and it was free. Events like today are great, but is the cost inhibitive to people considering Drupal rather than fully committed to it? I know Vlad's doing some great work in Brisbane. He runs the meetups out of the TAFE and he's organizing a camp in February next year. And similarly, Murray does some great work running meetups out of the TAFE in Sydney. I know the New Zealand meetup committee were talking about running some hack days to build some sites for NGOs as a way to onboard new people to the project. So I'd like to talk about this more with you and a good place to talk about it would be at the sprint day tomorrow. Max became a regular contributor after the last one and maybe you could too. Nice one, <clears throat> thanks for that Lee. So uh, I think you covered a lot of ground there uh, and there's a lot of exciting stuff in store with, with Drupal 10 and beyond. Um, I think that manage permissions tab looks like it's going to be a new favorite already um, for our crew. Um, and I think overall, I know from, from our perspective as a business, we're loving this new era of modern Drupal and the release roadmap. <laughs> Just looking, thinking back to the, the study you talked, those dates you ran through, are there any really real key dates um, that you really want people to pay attention to and you think should be, should be drivers for activity? Yeah, I think so. I think um, well, the first one is obviously coming up soon, which is the 9.1 end of life. That will be early December when 9.3 comes out. So if you are on 9.1, you can move to 9.2 now, which will have another six months of security support. Uh, obviously, the June 2022 for Drupal 10 release is very important. Uh, there are a few things that we still need to do. So if you are interested and in, you have some spare bandwidth to help, uh, please reach out to me. I am aware that everyone is very busy at the moment. It's a very busy, yeah. <laughs> lots of work on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, th 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 those are probably the two key dates. Um, some things that you can do that probably don't seem like, uh, uh, don't take as much uh, invested of prior knowledge is helping with that CK85 testing. Uh, there's going to be, we really hope to get that uh, experimental version in 9.3. And that will enable people to enable it in their Drupal 9 sites and run the upgrade path because there is some work to upgrade your uh, input format configuration from 9 to 10 and make sure that they don't get any issues. And if they do report those issues, that's a really critical part of that. Um, Interestingly, we've seen that the main issue with these major upgrades is to do things that make major data changes. And that's definitely one of those. So the more testing we can get before then will help those that come after us have a smoother process. Yeah. Looking at their range of new features uh, coming out, um, are, there, are there any that you think are particularly relevant or that you're really um, keen to see make a big splash? And conversely, are there uh, some, some features that you think are less important for maybe a more experienced Drupal agency or dev? Yeah, I mean, I think I touched on that a bit in the presentation. I, I think some of the things in there there is uh, the chance as an experienced developer, you look at it and go, well, I'm never going to use that. But I think I encourage you to uh, assess that feature through the lens of a newcomer to the project and then think if it's important. I think uh, if we need to continue to grow the project for its long-term sustainability, and we definitely do, um, then we need to be uh, thinking about those that are new and to use sort of a breadcrumb analogy uh, in leaving a trail behind us for those that come after us and things like automatic updates and project browser definitely fit into that category but also that easy out of the box initiative you know there are people out there still starting with Drupal that are installing it and getting 
you know, biotic as a start and then you know image fields on article content types and thinking okay that's the right way to do things um i'd hope they install umami which is a lot better which is using things like layout builder and, and all of the the new fancy things but the reality of it is that says you know demo do not use and then you're supposed to uninstall it and start with standard or or something uh, even leaner still with maybe minimal for the experienced developers i think the two uh, the bundle classes is definitely a game changer um, on a project that i work with at the moment with some long-term drupal developers uh, have been around on the project you know for probably 10 years or so you know we've added that patch already to the sites running 9.1 and it's instantly changed the productivity of the project things that used to be scattered you know maybe in a hook here or a twig template there or a pre-process um, they now go in that class you can write a unit test for that it's uh it's a real game changer as most said uh also the revision access stuff i think is is really important if you're trying to do anything a uh, little bit out of the ordinary with json api where you need to have access to revisions so some of the stuff like stuart's doing with druxt is building uh, decoupled editing experiences and obviously being able to access all the data that the forms and themes can over json api is important so i think those features will unlock a lot more experimentation and will improve our offering in that space uh, these feature releases that are, that are driving the roadmap um, that we're all super keen for, uh, they do depend on consistent contrib, right? Um, yes, yes. They and, do, yeah. and, and you know, increasing that, that that core contrib team and, and contrib across the board. And you know, you, you mentioned we're all busy, and yeah, we are. <laughs> like, we are all busy. Um, but your own company and, and in your own personal practice, you've consistently maintained a high level of contribution. Um, whilst getting the business done you know what's your secret sauce you know, how do you how do you unlock that conundrum how do you how do you make it happen without letting your day-to-day -day drive out that that desire to contribute uh, i think i've been doing it for a long time now so it probably comes second nature to me but it, i think insight from people like max who just you know done this recently made this transition recently would be, would be helpful here as well um i think what max said at the time was the sprint was the kick that he was needing but i think just get involved is is the first uh the first step there's quite a lot of people and they're all uh involved and knowing who's who in the series helps and uh i mean i'm happy to wait find and point people to who the right person to ask is because i think often knowing who to ask is is part of the problem uh we have some initiatives like bug smash which is a great way to get involved um personal plug for that initiative that it's, it's based in an Australian time zone, Australian New Zealand time zone, actually. It's also uh, friendly to India and it's the only initiative that is. Most of the other initiatives meet at stupid o'clock in the middle of the night. Uh, we have meetings every second Tuesday at 2 p.m. in Australian standard time, which would be 4 p.m. New Zealand standard time, 5 p.m. daylight time, 3 p.m. Sydney time, and I think it's 9 a.m. in India. Uh, and basically we plot how we're going to smash bugs in core. And We've made some huge inroads. I think uh, we're very close to a 10% reduction in the number of open bugs in a little under 18 months. So it's uh, a great way to get involved. It's a very approachable group. It's a small commitment of time. Come along for one hour on Tuesday and chat with people and you may go away with something to do for homework. Um, but if you do get stuck, there's a really approachable group of people there that can help you with the next step. So often um, you might find an issue, you might write a patch and it might just sit there waiting for needs review. There's a real good culture of review swapping in that initiative. So if you want someone to review your issue, you, you sort of post with a particular emoji, they'll review it and then you can review theirs. Um, and that's how sort of things move forward. But I think it also needs to be set at an organizational level. I'm lucky in working in an organization where it's part of our DNA. And I'm also lucky with the clients that I work with who are also family committed to the project. And a lot of them, uh, contribution is in their DNA. So if we're working on a feature, we might say in the onset okay we think this has got merit for the whole project and we'd like to open source it what do you think and overwhelmingly our clients will say yes and i think that's why we see features like you know the revision access stuff that service new south wales have been championing and it's taken a long time it's we've been re-rolling that patch since probably 8.4 8.5 it's taken a long time to get it in we're talking maybe three years there now um but as a result, the final patch is better. And 
um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that project will be looking forward to getting those patches off there and just running with straight up core. Similarly, uh, we, we, some of the universities that we work with, uh, a lot of the things that they require aren't unique to their business and they have implications for other universities. So we will say, okay, you know, you get this much functionality out of the module by default. If you're wanting this extra little bit, do you have any objections to making that part of the project? And we go through that process and release that. And then everyone, everyone benefits. I mean, to use the cliche, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, in, in terms of that kind of organizational or, or business support for, for contribution, uh, you touched a little bit on the uh, the Drupal Association's push for a certified partner model. Uh, do you think that's going to help get those businesses and maybe some of those client businesses more on board with Contrib? I hope I hope that it does. Yeah, I, th I think um, looking at it at the moment, there there are quite a few Australian organisations that will qualify for it. Is my understanding, and I think it's. Uh, recognition that they deserve. I think at the moment, every, every six months at a Dries note, they might see their logo flash up on the um, on one of the slides. And I think this is kind of extending that further. And that that goes also to to organizations that aren't agencies. So I think at the last Dries note, you know, to see some of our client logos on that screen is, is also um, really fulfilling. So I, I think this will continue down that route. Just to flick over to, to one of the other major themes um, that you touched on, and it's a, it's a big issue for us, is getting talent into Drupal, getting new people on board. Uh, do you think that the the moves towards decoupled, um, better handling for JavaScript, um, that is a, a door to bring people new in? Or do you, do you see that as a kind of a, a, a side issue and we need to do more um, with your kind of core traditional Drupal? Uh, I, I absolutely think JavaScript is the future. And um, I talked about this at length at the decoupled days session, but I think some of the work that Stuart doing in, in this space is the kind of place we need to be go. That's obviously geared towards Nuxt and Vue, um, but we need similar for React and, and Next. And what I'd like to see in that space is a lot more contribution, uh, a lot more collaboration. So Stuart's obviously open sourced all of Druxt, which I um, thank you for doing so. What we see a lot of decoupled solutions is people are off building their own things off to the side. And I'm sure they're coming up with some great patterns and some great solutions. And thinking about ways that we can componentize those and make them small utility components so that other organizations can you know, continue to build and improve those. And so part of that is continuing the way that we collaborate, which is on Drupal.org. Um, in, you've typically seen with the project that modules that live on GitHub are harder to find and harder to get collaboration than those that live on Drupal.org. And so the Drupal Association making GitLab available, you know, the full feature set for non-PHP projects is important in this space because I think it keeps the community together on Drupal.org but also gives us all the benefits that you would get from somewhere else. So, you know, we can ship packages to NPM. We can... Uh, have GitLab pages for documentation. We can use GitLab CI for testing that isn't, you know, running PHP unit um, and linting, etc. In terms of does that attract new people to the community? I'm not sure. And this, and this is a, a tricky space, I think. Um, one of the things that we've been doing when trying to recruit is actually gone into those communities to try and, and find people that have front end skills that are interested, you know, looking for work that aren't wary of Drupal. And we, we basically, you know, no Drupal knowledge required is kind of the message that we're sending because a lot of the front end tooling, which I think Ricky spoke at at the last session that we have here is about, um, you know, generic front end tooling, not Drupal specific. Um, there is some prior knowledge required of, of Twig, but it's not that dissimilar to say JSX. And one thing I did notice in reaching out to those communities and looking into their job boards is that the volume of looking for work versus hiring in our community versus um, compared with that in say uh, Gatsby or, or JavaScript communities is completely opposite. If you drop into the jobs channel on Slack, it's just, you know, a sea of we're hiring, here's a job, we're hiring, here's a job. Whereas if you drop into the, um, the contrasting channel in say some of these JavaScript communities, which tend to be, uh, they, they use Discord, 
it's, it seems to be the other way. There's a lot more on the for hire. So I think whilst um, it's hard to find people, I think it's still a good career choice. And I think if we could somehow convey that to people that, you know, get past that initial learning curve. And I think Nathan said yesterday that you've got to push through that first, you know, six, 12 months of the learning curve to realize the real value out of Drupal. Um, if we can, you know, maybe by those secure jobs is how we get people to push through that. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think the work that uh, we need to sort of do some more advocacy work, I think going out to communities, proposing sessions about Drupal for things that we wouldn't normally talk about. Um, I've tried to do that. I've given a couple of sessions at React conferences, but focused on React. I have submitted some things for those conferences with a Drupal theme. I submitted one for say Jamstack, you know, with Drupal as a decoupled CMS because it, you know, that's their whole business, right? Is decoupled CMS is backing Jamstack. But unfortunately, yeah, I think we've probably got a bit of a stink on us, but we'll have to see how we go there. Uh, but I'd like to see more people doing that and, uh, you know, encouraging people that, I think it's not your grandfather's Drupal maybe is the message we have to go with. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair comment as well. You know, I think um, Drupal has really made a huge investment and, and no small amount of pain in, in modernizing its, its architecture and its approach. And it's, uh, it's not your grandfather's Drupal anymore, is it? It's, it's, no. There's an opportunity for us to push forward and really exploit those benefits we've worked hard for. Yeah. I think we've got time for maybe just like one more quick little question, and this is kind of more of a more of a personal question. You've been involved for a long time. You've you've done a lot of um, really good work for the Drupal community. What keeps you engaged and motivated? What what drives you forward? That's actually an easy question. It's the the opportunity to work with some of the smartest people in the world. Um, the people that are involved in contribution, it, without a word of lie, are some of the most technically brilliant people that I've ever met. Um, or many of them I've never met, I've only met um, virtually. But I think that intellectual um, stimulation is is something you just I don't, can't get from anything else. And, you know, the ability to learn from some of the brightest minds out there effectively at no charge, only other than your time, I think is pretty compelling. Uh, I've made no bones of the fact that, you know, when I started contributing to Core back in Drupal 7 days, you know, there are a lot of things I didn't know. You know, I didn't know what an interface was in PHP. I didn't know a lot of modern OO programming paradigms. And I've learned pretty much all of that by putting up patches and having someone who's an expert review it and learning from their knowledge and sort of, and now I sort of get to pass a lot of that on, which is good. But I think you can't put a price on the amount of stuff that I've learned just from other people giving me constructive feedback on, you know, my things, the things that I've done. Yeah. So for me, that, that that's what keeps me coming back. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. That's a, that's a great incentive for, uh, for anyone out there wanting to get involved, I think. You know, uh, devs, documentation, uh, front end, UI, UX, whatever. Thanks for your talk. Um, no worries. Just got, just got one more minute left. I know you're, you're back tomorrow for the sprint. You're, you're mentoring this online sprint tomorrow. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, or Lee, or wants to follow up, I think it's probably a good opportunity. Um, on behalf of the community here, local community and internationally, I'd just like to say thanks. Uh, you know, we really appreciate your work. Um, yeah, thanks. The role, the role you've played on the project for so long and putting yourself out there um, and being so available um, and talking so much. It's really inspirational, um, it's motivating, um, and yeah, just to see what can be done. I think we should be um, all proud of the project and. Uh, Big thanks for, uh, from all of us for, for everything you've done. No worries. Thanks for the opportunity. It's um, yeah, My first presentation was in 2010, and I drove down from Bundaberg to Brisbane with no idea what I was in for. And um, yeah, to come to be able to speak as a keynote is an absolute honour. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thanks very much. And um, it's time for us to wrap up the session. And the next one is starting in a few minutes. So. Choose your channel and I will see you in there. Wonderful. Thanks again, Lee. Thanks. Bye.